Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel. Let's see what popped up in theaters this week. When Captain Jack Sparrow first appeared over a decade ago in the first Pirates movie, he was a revelation. He was everything a great supporting character should be. Electric, charismatic, funny. But, 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 he was a supporting character. He had to be. The real lead character of the Pirates movie franchise is, of course, Will Turner, played by Orlando Bloom. And even though Will Turner could never be as interesting or as fun to watch as Captain Jack Sparrow, you just need a solid hero with an identifiable goal to drive the narrative of your movie. Something that the fourth installment, the weakest by far, and the first to try to put Jack Sparrow into the leading man role, was such a failure. We don't want our heroes to be cowardly, to succeed by accident, or to be manipulated the entire movie by the desires and the drives of other people. That's the other thing about the evolution of Captain Jack Sparrow. He went from being the best pirate I've ever seen to a pathetic, inconsequential fool who can't even command the respect of his own crew or even his own enemies. Basically, while we were all chuckling over his antics, he slowly but surely turned into Jar Jar Binks. And that's sort of where we find him at the beginning of this fifth outing, the baffling, unfocused, but occasionally really diverting Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. Friendless, rudderless, literally he has no ship, and when trying to pull a bank heist, completely, utterly useless. He's also, now, now hey, how about that, he's back to being a supporting player again. A very prominent supporting player, of course, but here the Will Turner role is filled by this guy, Brendan Thwaites, aka the Aladdin-looking guy from Gods of Egypt. Now he's a little bland, but thankfully he gets a little assist from the lovely Kea Scolidario, who plays a woman of science with a map that no one can read. Thankfully, as she will point out every chance she can get, she is a woman. And this time period wasn't very kind to women. And a smart woman who knows about things like math and science, why, why, in this time period, she's thought of as a witch. Ha 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 ha! Those ignorant backwards men. Isn't that funny? I hope you think it's funny because you will hear that joke time and time again throughout this movie. This sort of clumsy feminism that's been handled way more sensitively in just about every movie ever made from Beauty and the Beast to the most recent Star Wars is not only repeated ad nauseum, but it's woefully mishandled. You know what else is woefully mishandled? The story's internal logic. Our two young heroes are after a mystical item called the Trident of Poseidon, which has the power to lift any curse. Despite the fact that, as a woman of science, she doesn't believe in such hooey, and the person that he's trying to lift the curse from, well, I won't tell you who it is, but I wasn't under the impression that this person was cursed at all. I just thought he was sort of doing his job, man. Now, it's difficult to say more without someone crying spoilers at me, so let me just instead list the things in this movie that didn't make sense. For starters, the rules of the supernatural elements at play. The trident, something called the Devil's Triangle, the various curses, what the rules and powers are for that compass of jacks. Yes, that thing has even more powers we didn't know about. I didn't understand them, and I'm pretty sure very few of the characters understood the various boundaries and loopholes of these mystical items, even in the very moments that they're exploiting them. Plus, this guy is a major antagonist, and his motivations for engaging in battles to the death over this trident never go much deeper than a couple of growled lines. Also, there is a real witch in here. I didn't get what her whole deal was, or why or how she helps the people that she helps. There's also a long sequence at a wedding, and a cameo by none other than Paul McCartney that both do nothing except burn up some more screen time. And who boy, now, now let's get to the film's main villain, shall we? And that would be this guy, Capitan Salazar, played with obvious relish by Javier Bardem. Now he is actually kind of scary as hell, and in terms of effects and character design, incredibly well realized. If only as much care had gone into making him a consistent character with an easy to follow motivation. Here is a cursed pirate hunter seeking revenge against Captain Jack Sparrow, the man whose actions resulted in him getting cursed. So when he finds out that Sparrow is looking for something that has the ability to break curses, why does he show virtually no interest in getting that thing and keep trying to kill the people that have the best chance of retrieving it? However, this is still a Pirates of the Caribbean movie, and if you're willing to sort of stick it out or ignore the things that don't make any sense, I gotta tell you, the whole third act of this movie, I really, really liked. I love the final steps to find the trident. I love the last minute revelations. Love the performance of Jeffrey Rush, who I haven't talked about yet. He's once again having a hell of a time as Captain Barbosa. I love the resolution of the story, even if I hadn't understood a lick of it along the way. And besides the engaging final third, there was also a nice action scene in the middle with a guillotine that I quite enjoyed. A whole boatload of eye-popping visual effects throughout the film. And, of course, two words, zombie sharks. 
As frustrated as I was with the middle section of this movie, I must admit that after such a strong finish, I just sort of stayed in my seat while the credits rolled, smiling to myself, in spite of myself, and enjoying the big bombastic pirate movie score, which this time is composed by Jeff Zanelli, who had the good sense to recycle most of the great Hans Zimmer cues from the earlier films in the series. And wouldn't you know, after that I was rewarded with a post credit scene that really kinda pissed me off because it hints at something that would once again contradict the rules that were established earlier. <sighs> they just had to get a little too cute. So, where does that leave us? Well, I tell you, I went back and forth on this one, and I have to say that it's really, really close to a small bag of popcorn for me, but in the end, uh, the picture managed to eke out a mild, literally the mildest and most indifferent of recommendations from me. If you're a fan of the Pirates movie franchise, and I do mean the entire franchise, not just the first one, then you'll probably find that this is a voyage worth taking, even if the vessel isn't always seaworthy. If, however, you need some convincing, well then I'm not the guy to do it. Just keep your booty at home. That does it for this edition of Movies That Pop. Don't forget to follow me, the Colonel, on Twitter, at Movies That Pop. And click the icon right down there to visit our channel if you'd like to see more, and support us by clicking subscribe while you're there, and by clicking the thumbs up icon below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales in the comments as well. In the meantime, thanks for watching, I'm the Colonel, and this is the day that you will always remember as the day that you almost got a small bag of popcorn.